Oh. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. We are here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> can you can you hear me, Joan? I can hear you. Oh, terrific. I didn't think I'd be able to get the audio. Thanks. Still letting people in from the waiting room. Okay. So we'll give it a few more minutes. <sighs> Hi, Barb. Hi, Katrina. <laughs> it's Alessa. Oh, Alessa. Hi, Alessa. Yes. Hi, Barb. <laughs> you too. <laughs> I'm here too. Hello, Barbara. Been a while. <laughs> You're looking good. Thank you. Where are you? I'm looking for Alessa. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Where you are. <laughs> I'll find you up here. Yeah. I'm going to test that you can see my screen. I don't want to share screen. Share screen. There. Oh, can, very good. Can everybody see that? It's very yep. small. Yeah. Is it small? Hang on. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Oh. It's not well, that I print small. I printed them. Yeah. So they're they're not that small. We can see them quite well. At least I can. If you go full screen, it's easier to read. I also have a magnifying glass if I need it, but I can read that. Oh. I feel like it should, I should be able to make it bigger, but oh, hang on. More people, <laughs> got to admit them. You should need to go to the lower right corner, the plus oh. sign, uh, two icons, on, no, no, lower. Oh. Lower corner, lower right. Hang on, I, my, you guys are, Covering that up. Oh. Uh, yep. There. Last thing. Yep. There. Better? Oh. Much better. Much better. That's better? Yep. Yep. Thank you, whoever that was with the tip. Sure, that's <laughs> Although me, we can't see the Sorry. whole poem now. Oh, there we go. But I can I can scroll as a as the reader reads. Okay. Well, we've got lots of people and hopefully. Um, more that didn't, you know, have theirs done at the time that you um, put together the packet. So should we get going? Sure. sure. Hang on. Well, let's start with our group poem. Um, if you can see it here, it is all in pieces. I do this when I'm um, rearranging my own poems as well. I, I would rather manipulate them than, than do it on the computer. So I hope I did not lose anybody's lines. Demands of the forest that reveal a tragedy of intrigue. But that's not the point I thought here. Hang on, hang on. Could, uh, hang on. Buddy, could everybody mute uh -huh. themselves if they're not reading a poem? Hang on. Okay. Now it's quiet. There we go. Tori, you ready? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Demands of the forest that reveal a tragedy of intrigue. Grinning in Paris, I see fluttery breaths, my friend, while squirrels trampoline on a yard sign and blood clots cancel all hope of a journey, but meld to soothe or awaken memory like a cracked glass paperweight filled with a colorful swirl of wonder, joy, and awe that feels like stroking a dolphin, silliness that sounds like a giggle and smells like mints. 
A square of sunshine purring with the cat, the slender butterfly bursts in explosions and tears, and the endangered monarch on the pink coneflower awakens bursts of joy. I want to put them in a vase. But here in the attic of life, perfect answers linger, concealed in nooks and crannies, and invisible roots create explosions, although that's impossible because they've dug in deep. I say this because I'm a miner with a goal, which may be shallow or casual, but my mind knows the family traits. And yet, all I feel is the river, and you can't see the tadpoles because they look like mud. South of here, I know the meaning is not in motion, and the shell monster who dances slumped on the floor is caught uncertain on rolling ground. It's rage like pounding a cast iron pot with the hammer of my heart, worry that feels like fingers grasping the confessional pew, embarrassment that looks like a tug of war, and jealousy that looks like dirty snow. Sadder than slender robins painting with knives, the palette their tongues forever clothed with the odor of living, I cradle a hummingbird skull, bring an invisible butterfly to tears that explode when I say goodbye, our conversation in rags as we fly away. That's all of you together. Uh, corresponding with you has been so enjoyable, and it's been a real learning experience for me, as I hope it has been for you. Uh, there's so many of us that my original plan was to summarize first the lessons that I, I gave to people and give you a couple more lessons, but there won't be time for that. So I plan on um, the discussion bringing up those points that um, may be helpful to some of the rest of you if we're not doing a poem of yours. A couple of announcements. The triad opens uh, June 1st. There is a special category for emerging writers, but that doesn't mean you can't enter all three categories, uh, the poet's choice and the theme. And it's all explained on the website. Uh, the theme is uh, what would have, could have, or should have been if. And that's on the website as well. So I won't have to repeat that. Another thing for you to know is that what Tori did here um, is not going to stay up. Your poems are not considered published uh, when you put them out for a workshop. Um, that's not when a literary journal says unpublished or a contest says unpublished. These are still unpublished when you've used them for this. Uh, one last announcement. A couple people when I was corresponding said they could understand every word that I said, but when we had discussion, they couldn't pick up what the other people were saying. Uh, so try to speak loudly when we're talking about these poems. And I'll watch the clock uh, so that we can make sure we get through the 16 we have, and then hopefully have time for some of the rest of you that were still working on your final revision at the time that, that Tori did this. So Jenna is up first. If Jenna is here. Okay, I am now unmuted. Can everybody hear me? Uh -huh. I can and, hear you. Um, Joan, do you want me to just read the after poem? The, I think in the interest of time, we'll have to do that. And if you could start with a statement of what I suggested you do, um, it's up to all of us. I'm going to be looking at the draft while you read the final, but that may not work for other people. They can be looking at the final, but I'm sure we won't have time to read both the drafts in the final. Um, so read us your final. Okay. Solo skinny dip. April, still a bit cruel. The sun needs more hours to warm up the fresh quarry, but today the sun breaks the gray. I will plunge into the first annual open water swim. You will stay safe on the silty shore. How carefully you step out of closed toe shoes, then peel your pale feet from wool socks. 
I try not to cringe at your predictable shriek when waves reach your feet. You stay safe and dry, feet firmly land planted. I stretch my arms overhead, pull off my thermal shirt, slip free of silk camisole, then kick off sturdy jeans. I go deep to finger scrape the muddy bottom. This is where the fossils and treasures lurk. You stay dressed. I need to be naked and alone. Do you want me to kind of explain what you suggested? Yes, then? if you could tell them what I suggested, and then we'll see if they think that was a good idea. Um, originally, I had written a poem that was based more on the exercise Joan gave us, and it, that poem kind of took me to this poem. Um, she suggested um, some different wordings and that she found kind of awkward on the first version. And I realized that I had put it, I had always had it in first person voice and I'm writing as the other person is my um, former husband who was very um, adverse to any kind of, you know, danger or whatever. But um, I, I wanted, I thought that you had said change it to present tense which I thought I did but I realized it's still not quite I should well, have said, I put a note saying I thought you had too and you did in the first stanza you did and then you went back to future tense but it would be very easily all stay in present tense okay so I will definitely do that if I when I come back to this poem so thank you again for your help anyone have any Comments or suggestions? Oh, the, the poem is very beautiful. And li I like, for example, the inner rhymes, uh, line four, today in gray, or uh, shriek and feet. Uh, that's, uh, don't, uh, they are not so obvious, but they add a melody uh, to it. And mm -hmm. especially the last line, I like it really much. It's like, you can quote it even, I need to be naked at the loan. Um, so that's uh, what uh, I really like about that poem. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Jenna. Yeah, that that last line, I need to be naked and alone is, yes. yeah, really brings it together. Yes. Plus, I like uh, uh, open water swimming. So uh, something like that really speaks to me. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand why you're saying that it isn't all in the present tense, because I can not find anything that looks like it's in the past tense. I will plunge um, sure. in the first stanza, but then she's in present tense after that. But today the sun okay. breaks the gray. So it's not that it's past, there's some future. That's, future, future that's tense, right. I will plunge. Um, right. And what I suggested to her was the present tense is more immediate. It brings us along Yeah, uh, when you're in present tense, which, all of these things, I hate to say, you know, it's more immediate because sometimes in some other poem, the future tense will work beautifully. Yeah. Um, you know, that all of these rules are meant to be broken. So let's move on. And who, um, Macy, right? This is the one with the typo that we laughed about today. Okay, yeah, we said maybe the artificial intelligence got a hold of my poem and added uh, something at the end. Can you um, hear her? Okay. Um, Eve changes the course of history after William Carlos Williams. Afterwards, Adam and Eve bathed in a pond under the rocky ledge. Let me cleanse your feet, he said. I would rather wash them myself, she said. I want you to be my pedestal Venus. That is sacrilege, she said. But a goddess can't carry any scent of sin. You will not strip the fragrance of free will from me, Eve said, and broke the bar of soap and gave him half. 
that's the typo of a sturgeon is not supposed to be on there. We don't know quite how that happened, but um, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered. Uh, can you tell about the changes? That's hilarious. Okay. Um, well, we talked, one of the things that, that came up was the title and we, and, um, I explained the title and then, um, Joan came up with, um, maybe Eve changes the course of history. And one thing she said is in, um, classes, she'd often ask students, um, she'd show the titles of the, the poem and ask them which ones they'd like to learn more about or what they thought they were about. And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at the title. Um, we, I had a, um, I made the um, first line an active tense that was just a overlook on my part. Um, we went back and forth on clean, wash, and cleanse. Um, and I ended up, even though wash um, is more um, current, I like the word cleanse in the context that it was um but we really came on uh, the sentence about you will not strip the fragrance of free will from me and making it um focused on um her um having the free will and and not wanting to lose it um so adding that uh free will from me on there um and um okay go ahead oh if you've got something else go no go i ahead. think that's about it uh what she was saying about um the title uh what i used to do with my students on days when we were going to share poems like this i'd say we'd go around the room and everyone would say what their title was and almost and then i'd say what do you want to hear? And almost always there'd be one title that everyone would go, this is the one we want to hear. And if you look at rewriting history, it's not a bad title, but Eve changes the course of history um, is so much more specific that I think it makes us want to want to hear the poem. Uh, comments? Uh, yes. My name is Gary. Along that line that you just mentioned, Joan, I had a feeling in the first line that I didn't want to see Adam and Eve. I just wanted to hear afterwards they bathed in a pond under the rocky ledge and then let me cleanse your feet, Adam said. Oh. I would rather wash them myself, Eve said. It lets me, it, it lets me discover as I read the poem what it's about. What do you think of that idea? Um, that's that's interesting. I I am a, I was a little um, that he said she said going back and forth a lot. I I think I do like that. That adds a little bit of um, change to the he said she said, and I, I think it works. And the first um, line. I was, first line. I was also. Oh, go ahead. First line becomes a little tighter then. Afterwards, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. bathe in a pond under the rocky ledge. I want to read on. Right. Um, I was also, this is not on, on that vein really, but I was wondering if to kind of make it clearer between the Eve and Adam's conversation, if I could italicize like Adam, what Adam says and, and mm -hmm. just leave the ones in um, quotes for Eve or not. I think uh, I would do all or nothing, either yeah. italics or quotes. Yeah. Right. Okay. I just, okay. I didn't know whether it was clear of going back and forth with, um, I want you to be my pedestal Venus, and then she talks, and then he talks again, if that was confusing or not. My favorite line is, that is sacrilege. It's such a short line, but you know, considering this, this is the beginning. Um, that is sacrilege. She knows right away that sacrilege is is lovely. <laughs> Let's move on, Lucy. Or am I? Uh, did I turn my page too far? Yes, I'm I did. Yeah, it's I did. Not me Quite Gary's yet. first. 
Okay, that's mine. The name is spelled wrong. Uh, it's Haren, H-A-R-E-N. Ooh. Up on top, just so. I see it. Sorry, that's me. That's it. That's my typo. I apologize. Okay, I just unmuted. I was un I was muted again somehow. Can everybody hear me? A little bit. Okay. Moon basket. As the full moon reflects on the lake and a night breeze ripples the water, I stand on the shore with my granddaughter who holds a little basket in her hand. Look, Grammy, the moons on the water look like stars in the sky. Why don't you collect them in your basket, I suggest. No, I can't, she complains, they are too many. Just close your eyes and reach for them. But if I shut my eyes, then I can't see them. Oh yes, you can if you try. I can't, I can't, she cries, but squints her eyes tight shut. Then, oh yes, Graham, she exclaims, they are so beautiful. And the basket falls from her hand into the water and fills with silver moons. Thought? Okay, the suggestions. Suggestions b basically at first was to build in there um, the little great the little granddaughter. Um, I had started with just um, uh, not explaining that there was a little granddaughter with uh, the, the grandmother. And uh, I wanted the poem just to kind of fill that in as it went along. And Joan's suggested was, suggestion was to bring that in right at the start. And I, I agree that helps. It, it gets it out of the way. It's understood right away. And then there were a few little word changes along the way. And I changed the, um, the form of the poem to couplets. I thought it was originally a mix of uh, lines, stanzas, uh, one five, one three, and some some couplets, and then it finished with a uh, triplet and a mention at the end. Her basket dropped from her hand into the water and filled with silver moons and millions. That was a little bit much. I like the suggestion. Uh, just fills with silver moons. I think the couplets help. Are, are, are better in keeping with the nature of dialogue that the poem has. Mm. So that's basically it. Thoughts, anyone? Oh, I like your poem very much. Good. I think it's, I would say, like very poetic. Uh, you change a simple observation that uh, when the moon shines on the water and they are ripples, it looks like there is many of them. And uh, makes it a very nice, uh, you know, and touchy story between a grandfather and his granddaughter. Yes, so. I thought you captured the um, discovery of wonder involved in childhood very well. You described that, uh, and I liked that. Thanks. Uh, to to me, the the really powerful couplet is the "just close your eyes and reach for them." It kind of opens up this. Um, little child's world to like anything is possible if she just, um, you know, stops listening to the naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It could be a picture book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the couplets, I think the couplets work very nicely. And that ending and fills with silver moons. Yeah. Is really beautiful. Um, a thought on this, um, I was wondering, it, would uh, making this in third person, what would that do to the poem? Is it better this way? I stand on the shore with my granddaughter. She, well, then it's the granddaughter. She stands on the shore right. with her grandmother. Uh -huh. Could be a different kind of poem. Oh, it would be. Mm -hmm. It could be an interesting experiment to try it from everybody's point of view, from mm -hmm. the grandpas, from the grandmas, and from the child. Mm -hmm. And that can see that, and the basket falls from my hand into the water and fills with mm -hmm. silver moon if it's coming from the child. Yeah. You can right. also write it from the moon perspective. Also. <laughs> true. That's true. true. And the waters. And Every, the water. Everyone can yeah. get into it. Yep. An interesting thing happened along with the creation of this poem. 
I'm trying to create a chat book. And it occurred to me that the title here of the poem and the idea of what it's about could make the title of a chat book really nicely. Oh. With every one of the poems in the chat book being, in a sense, its own bright, shining silver moon. Or a basket for right. some moon. Right. Does that make sense? That makes lots of sense. Good. Okay. That's Lucy. That's Sorry? Oh, I was just calling on Lucy. <clears throat> okay. Dusk Angels. Pointing the scarlet canoe upriver, I paddle alongside flood, floodplain silver maples. Broken ash trees tilt and touch water. Arcs of branches dimple the surface. Swamp smell hovers in the cooling air. As delicate curling tongues of white catch at brittle stems of beggar ticks, swirl in the backwaters, gather on green pools of duckweed, speckle the mighty sh muddy shore, I wonder whose feathers these are. Then when I round a bend beyond the bittern and the sandpiper, I see the answer, their white forms unmistakable in the distance. Disturbed by my presence, the two swans slap their webbed feet on the dim lit light water, their rotund bodies reluctant to rise before they sail down the river tree canyon coming my way. Six foot wingspans and trumpeting, oh, oh, burn the holy sky path above me. When my father was hospitalized, pneumonia in his lungs, sepsis in his blood, he said, I've seen angels, but I'm not ready to die. Now within a paddle's reach, they beckon to a wild life, clutch me to a quickening sense of cycles and creatures and time. The suggestion that was made was, one of them was to move the stands about my father to the middle of the poem. So it was canoeing father back to the swans. And I think that worked nicely. Another was to remove the ambiguity about whether it's bow or bow at the beginning because it hasn't been established yet that it's a canoe. So that was a good switch. And then there were some word choices and, um, oh, the other thing was to describe the white before asking, I wonder what those feathers were so that the reader could wonder what those white things mm. were. Mm -hmm. Comments. What? What are beggar ticks? They're a wetland, that word, that wetland, plant, wetland plant species. And mm. you've probably gotten the seeds on your pants walking through perhaps a swampy area because like ticks, they stick on your pants. That's how the seeds get dispersed. Okay, that word stopped me. And I remember in our discussion, um, you considered getting rid of that because nobody knows what it is. And I said, I've never seen bigger ticks in a poem before. And with the muddy shore and the duckweed and the bigger ticks and the sandpiper, it makes it very clear that the poet knows where she is. And so I wanted, I wanted the bigger ticks to stay. Well, the bigger ticks weren't even in there at first and then when i was adding a few things i added them and then you said don't take them out oh okay so this the draft on the left is not the first that's one of the later ones no that was the first but that doesn't have bigger ticks in it oh i thought it did yeah okay but because there were multiple versions then there was one that i wondered whether that was too obscure and you said, no, it gives, you've never heard of it. And it's sort of interesting. And 
it was probably the only thing that wasn't immediately, it wasn't as if there were multiple things that weren't understandable to a reader. Another thought in the second to the last stanza, I thought rotund was a little bit ugly. And I'm just wondering, it says what they are, they're big, big birds and rotund is right, but I just kind of wondered maybe just something like their heavy bodies reluctant to rise. Or even rounded if you want the R for reluctant, rounded bodies reluctant to rise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just did want to say about this poem that um, it, this is the sort of thing that inspires me to poetry too. When I see one thing in nature and it connects me to something in my own life mm. and that's, that becomes that sort of poetic moment. So I, um, as abrupt as it may seem just to be thinking about your father, when we're thinking about these, these swans, um, it, it kind of makes sense to me because it's the way I think too. That, that you make these connections that are almost involuntary um, and there they are and they need to be written about. Okay, Dwayne. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think this is like my fourth draft. I oh, I think so, I, yeah. You've been working <laughs> hard on this. <laughs> so I got a fifth in front of me. There are very slight differences, but... Um, um, so, uh, I appreciate, it. I really enjoyed, you know, I'm not real used to having people, um, collaborate with me, but I gotta say that I appreciate, uh, John, that, that I put a lot of trust in you and it was rewarded and I love the process. Well, thanks. So, <clears throat> yeah, as, as, uh, I'll, I'll just start with what I have now after the beginning of it all. On this night with the smell of medicine and faded hope hanging in the air between us. His thoughts were ink, drawing black dreams in an uneasy sleep. When a whimper from below roused me awake, by reflex, in panic, through touch and memory, I swung down from my bunk, read his covers with my hands, and found his face turned away. I whispered his name, a moan in reply. Shall I call mother? No, no. What can I do? Just stay. Okay. He turned and took my hand, rough and hard from play, holding on as if his frail grasp could anchor him to me, could anchor him to this place, holding on as if my sturdy hand were his. He wished aloud to wear such flesh. And then he said, he'd heard them when I thought he could not hear. He coughed and said he knew. It can't be fixed, you know? And I said, yes, though I did not know. I knew what it was to be sick, but to be sick and journey back was another way of being well. I did not know the thing that claimed him, that worried him in the dark, that carved a hollow place for him alone. Then the coughing came, heaving him, a tiny vessel tossed in sudden storm. I held his brittle bones to me with all the strength he wished he had until the fit passed and he was left limp from the elemental struggle. Will you stay? I will. Okay. And then no more to say. The breathing evened and I stayed as he slept in the dark. The only light a little brother could give was a promise to stay. <laughs> yeah, so that, that that got pretty personal, as you can probably tell. You know, uh -huh. and, uh, and, but it started from a little germ of just the exercise of finding random words and stringing together, and it just touched a nerve, a, a place that, a memory. No, no. <laughs> Thomas, it's really beautiful. I was crying. Now, the version you read is a little bit different than what we got. 
-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. There were a couple. No, no of problem. Things. But uh, what you read is actually, I think, even more beautiful. Okay, thank you. I I am not used. Uh, I am not used to. You, you, well, I'm not an experienced poet, obviously, but as I started with about three or four poems in, in this recent yeah. journey, um, I've been used to being more controlled and more formatted. This is more free verse or a mm. story, and that's different for me. And it was a real interesting you, challenge, I think, go about you. making. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just was asking how, what kind of comments you got and how you went about making these changes because this is quite a bit more detailed than the original version, I think, as I'm looking at it here. Oh, yes. I, and I, as I looked at other people's poems, nobody else seemed to elaborate as much as I did. Like I added an entire beginning just because I wanted to establish how do, how, how do you establish the darkness of a night, you know? because we're trying to paint, but to just paint things in black. So I thought maybe the idea of ink and black dreams would help mm. to start the idea because the idea of, of by memory and touch to swing out of a bunk bed, you know what it's like to be a child in a bunk bed. You don't need light to get out of your bed. You know where everything is, right? And that's how I find you know my brother that he's below me and I know exactly how to get down from there and I don't need light to do it. And you know, in the original, in the original one, I'm talking about Braille, but it's like, do I need to say that? Is it really reading like Braille, or is it just reading with my hands to find him and know where he is? So that well, we and if you look at the first draft, you can see it is. Um, he is. He doesn't blunt um, it. It says, "I won't live long." I could only agree, and he weaves that much more in the later draft that we know it. And it's kind of the unspoken when he said, I heard them talking rather than coming right out and saying it. And I think that's part of what makes it so emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate that were excellent. That, were, that was excellent advice. Uh, um, where things are, are fuzzy, you know, knowing what you know and, and wishing to be clear, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, well, I know we, we could talk about the fact that it's that you work from you work from things that are true, but you're still writing a fiction with mm -hmm. true things weaved together how you want them to communicate something that's true out of things that you weave together in a fictional way. Does that make sense? <laughs> makes great sense. I think we could talk about each of these poems for our whole session, but uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Move on here uh, to Angela. Okay. I think this went through at least four revisions, and so you were so generous with your time with me, Joan. Oh, thanks. I, I really appreciate it. I'll color myself pink. I'm weary from circling this labyrinth, crushing myself like an acorn under my boot. The pink sky of the morning shows up with its warning. My invisible tears are sadder than rags stashed among the roots to keep the woodchuck at bay insecurities butterfly behind a pretend grin while mulling on berries that nourish nothing within. Once upon a time in the attic of my dreams, I was a child's artwork stored like treasure and hung on display like bedclothes airing, cherished for its imperfections, coloring outside the lines. Birdsong flew off the page as it danced, licking the buttercream frosting sky. Bearing oneself was accepted, softened by the crust of the breeze, lovely as the forsythia in its scanty yellow leaves. So how do I explain this steady rain of gray? I'm afraid what I have to offer is not good enough, I whisper to this grown-up version of myself. This feeling that I'm unworthy gnaws at me. I'm hungry, starving for self-acceptance, stomach nodding as I burrow like an injured oak to toughen myself. Um, I know it was a lot about the rhythm, um, tightening my word choice, even figuring out who was speaking to whom. Um, 
and then my ending, I, I Joan had a very good way of explaining like how you would hold a finger out to a child when you want a young child, like a toddler to walk, who's learning to walk, not giving too much support, but just barely enough. And I tend to just tell the reader what I want them to get out of the poem. Um, and that's when all the poetic language tends to drop as well. So it was. There's so much more clarity in that second one. If you look at the first draft, I'm afraid what you offered is not good enough, he said. And we're going, okay, who is he? And if you look in the final, I'm afraid what I have to offer is not good enough, I whisper. And that, you know, nails what she was trying to, to say. Right. And, and I think, too, I'm, I'm discovering that. I'm letting the poem emerge, right? Because sometimes I do come with this preconceived idea of what I want to say. And, and you taught me to let just the poem speak for itself, which that cleared up that whole thing. Like, um, what was I trying to say in this poem? So thank you for that. And the, the title change does that. Yes, yes. Comments. I wanted to go back to that uh, line, uh, which is in cursive. And I'm, a, I'm afraid what I have to offer is not good enough. I think that really uh, like empowers that whole uh, poem. And that's basically what that uh, whole poem is about. So when it was uh, written before, it was somebody else telling the, the, the person here, right? Uh, um, that that person is not good enough. But then when it comes from yourself, that uh, highlights that it's a low self-esteem. And that's what really that poems about. So changing that was uh, really powerful. Uh, that uh, was my comment. The second, I really like the last two lines. Um, I burrow like an injured oak to toughen myself, right? Because it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something like that really is happening uh, in real life. Uh, when you scar a, a tree like an oak, it makes a burrow, but you can now, extrapolate to a human being and uh, has uh, completely new meaning. So I think it's very innovative and very poetic in the same time. And the third comment I want to say that uh, I'm not sure is it necessary to add in the third line from the bottom, starting for self-acceptance. That self-acceptance, I think it's too much self-explanatory what the poem is about. Maybe if you will, uh, it just, you know, like completely black and white. If you will let somebody to get yeah. to that uh, uh, conclusion by reading it and thinking about it, maybe that would be even more powerful. That makes sense. Good. I yeah. thought I had gotten rid of all that stuff, but now I see it. That's <laughs> day, right? All right, move, moving to the next one, Andre. Oh, me, all right, thank you. Thank you. So first reading, right? And then talking about it. Yeah. All right. The eye opener, sharp rays of winter sun twinkle on icicles hanging from evergreen trees like Christmas ornaments. Crystalline icicles suspended from rooftops look like dragon's teeth ready to bite. Beneath a roof's overhang, a man stands still, stuck in a pile of snow, his head tilted. The man's big eyes reflect clouds his fixed gaze full of surprise. It will take many cloudless days for the icicle protruding from his chest like a tooth on an Arctic dragon to melt. <laughs> All right, so in terms of comments, uh, when we get the prompts to write a poem, uh, I remember, I think the third one was that it should be a surprise or a very interesting mm -hmm. ending and then the stack to me. And I was thinking about many different things, uh, how to write a dub. And, uh, uh, and then I noticed when I went outside that the uh, weather is changing there this last uh, few uh, days of uh, winter and that I started to write this poem. Um, and in the beginning, um, uh, it, it was, I have some problems with the rhythm or uh, word choice. Uh, as you even see on the left-hand side, it says before I put in parentheses, 
whether I should um, add something like this or, or, or not. Um, I remember uh, also, Joanne, uh, we were talking about that, uh, uh, how to end it. I wanted to end it with the oomph, so that one word basically to melt. Uh, I thought it would be great to, uh, to, to end it like this. You almost would, I hope, feel that icy blue hitting uh, your chest. Um, uh, what else? Um, also, uh, uh, Joanne gave me very uh, good comments in terms of uh, the structure that, um, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, uh, in the second line of the first stanza, there are icicles, and then there are icicles in the first line of the second stanza, then the rooftops uh, from the second line uh, follow the roof from the first one on the stanza beneath and so on and so forth. So there is a nice like weaving of words uh, through that uh, whole poem. And uh, uh, I started it, I think, subconsciously, but then Joanne pointed it out to me and I think it was a, a great advice. So uh, by the way, Joanne, thank you very much. It was a great fun uh, working on it and participating in it. It was, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun to <laughs> see this develop. Mm -hmm. Comments well, the, quickly, because I uh, want to get yeah. to everybody. As the, as the, it strikes me how all of these are like paintings of different kinds, right? Mm -hmm. And I see, I see the painting of this. And Thank the you. last part of it is a surprise because you don't know, you don't know where to take that, you know, where the injury is. An icicle yeah. protruding from chest is pretty painful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know? And it's, and it's, and it's, it's like, it feels like a mystery. Like, um, where's this injury? where does this injury come from you know mm. thank you but, but i thought it was very beautiful I, I love the way you have his um open eyes are reflecting the clouds and then on the last stanza you go back to clouds by saying it's going to take cloud lust days yes. days of sunshine yeah. in order to finally melt the yes. the lethal mm -hmm. icicle that is that has yeah. killed this man so thank i really you. like all those parallel structures oh. that you have throughout the poem Thank you very much, Jenna. I, I would like to say that I try to be like very scientific. So uh, you may not know that, uh, but uh, when uh, people die, um, I, I'm a physician by training. So I saw a few people passing away. Um, when, uh, when they do that, their eyes become cloudy, mm. right? Uh, when people are alive, you can see the reflection, but then they become cloudy and they usually eyes move a little bit uh, when uh, people are alive. Uh, well, um, but then when somebody passes away, they have that fixed gaze. So I use this uh, things here and then cloudless days so the first was uh, because of the word play of words to put it like that. But the second is cloudless days means there is a lot of sun, right? So then you can uh, uh, think about connection with that sun with uh, melting of the icicle. Okay, Joseph is next. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Um, okay, so my poem is called uh, Becoming Goodbye. I have found that I often talk too much for my liking. Slender silence like a frayed tightrope is no longer my place of peaceful retreat. And things are hard to hold on to with arms flailing, unwilling to reach out. I am aware of what happens when road signs are ignored. So now I know I must meet this visitor, let him in and find out what sticks to his ribs quickly before the season changes forever. <laughs> Love or mind that always tastes like. So um, in terms of suggestions, uh, I really, really enjoyed this. I have to say that because I did what I thought was part of the instructions, which I just knocked out. The first draft was like, without even thinking about it, I just put down these words that just, you know, like train of consciousness. Um, or, and, and, and I turned it in and you can see there were two couplets that I began with in the first draft. And um, Joan taught me that those were scaffolding, which was, you know, not necessarily, you know, like um, necessary for the poem. And I, I, I kind of, I could really, really relate to what she was saying and how my mind works, you know. Um, so she said she thought it would be 
good idea to to start that with that line. I have found that I often talk too much for my liking because that's kind of more exciting. And it, it really did. That is where the poem begins. But I couldn't get rid of that second, that first couplet because finding things hard to hold or to hang on to, to me was a big part of the poem. So I stuck it in. And it works what you really well where you, might you need to add put it in the with the here arms to, flailing. To, to, you know, thank you. Um, and then the other thing you said um, was the end that uh, you wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, it just didn't, the way I had done it, it kind of smothers that ending. And you said to put it, make sure it had its own space, that last line, you know, suddenly becomes goodbye, um, which I really, you know, appreciated that. Um, and it was, it was pretty funny because it was like you had said in the last, um, workshop that uh, sometimes it's almost like psychotherapy or something, you know, you'll just say so, you'll just write something down and you don't even know what you're writing, you know, you don't even know where it's coming from. But I found, you know, quite a bit of that in this, in this, uh, you know, experiment or whatever you want to call it here. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I don't know, it is what it is. It's not really as autobiographical, biographical as you might think it is. I. I kind of mix what I'm going through or what I'm going through myself with what I've seen other people, especially friends of mine, go through where, you know, you know, they'll go through a huge breakup or something. And me having known them for years say, you know, I saw this, you know, if you had just sat down with yourself, you know, like five years ago or three years ago and said, what the hell's going on? You, you could have saved this, you know, you could have, this could have worked, uh, but you didn't, you know, you, you ran from it and you, just kept on, you know, talking too much and flailing your arms. And then you ended up, you know, losing something that now you're sorry you lost, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right, we need to move along because I'm wanting to get to everybody. Katrina. Ephemeral. It is that kind of blue sky day when the salamander's tail starts to dry 10 steps from the mud. The brown-winged butterfly sails over a crust of snowbank through the spring peeper's love-drunk calls, and the forest starts to push up green through last year's brown. I pick up the salamander, feel dewdrop cool feet wander over my palm, shift my hands for his gentle descent to new wet grass at the shady edge of the swollen marsh. And I'll post my learning points in the chat. Joan had some great ones for me. That's uh, a good idea in the interest of time um, because this is very beautiful. And I remember when we discussed it. Sure, and if you want to move ahead, you can. If you want me to go through them, I can too, whichever works better. Um, yeah. Let's yeah, hear I, some I, comments and maybe your changes will be part of that. Okay. Yeah, that's a very nice poem. Very beautiful. Thank you. I like all the hyphenated words. Brown mm -hmm. wind, blue sky, love drunk, dew drop cool. Very nice. Thank you. And those hyphens really helped with clarity. John helped me see that with the hyphens, the description was more specific and clear. I do remember from the discussion um, that I said, definitely put that salamander first because that was the most unique image I've seen in a poem in a long time. I never think about them drying out. Um, and if you look at the rough draft, she starts with a brown winged butterfly, but that blue sky day when the salamander's tail um, is very unique. Yeah, if you're going to post post them in the comments, that would be great. And we can move on to what, number 10? Yeah. Hey, um, encounters with awe. I extend both arms upward as I imagine the river of migrating raptors overhead. I extend both arms upward as I recall the Perseid meteor shower while paddling becalmed Lake Superior. I gaze upward, then down toward the water 
as I relive paddling among clouds reflected in Owen Lake. Journeys approaching oneness with the universe. And John's main comments were um, to make this stronger and more active um, from my draft to put in myself to start the lines with the word I, um, to put in my whole person rather than just saying my arms are stretching or moving. And then um, the title also um, thought about the title that made a bit more sense to what I was trying to look into is encountering nature experiences. And I looked at uh, the word be calmed instead of mirror, um, clear or mirror calm, because I think be calmed is a, is a nicer word to use. So um, just looking at some of the word choices too, so. And I, I'm also in more revisions now looking at the word skyward instead of the word upward that I've used very often, so. I like Skyward. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Other comments? Um, I'm, uh, res I recently moved to the area. And let's say uh, general knowledge is uh, knowing what uh, Lake Superior is. But uh, I am not really familiar, and pardon my ignorance, what's Owen Lake is. Mm. So if oh, somebody yes. else from around the world will be reading this, um, they might not probably understand that uh, particular line. Okay. So, but yes, so, so what's the Owen Lake? Should I go there? It, it, it's just a, a local lake in my area. I see, I see. Yeah. So. Okay. Next, Barbara. Mm -hmm. My poem is, uh, bless you for breaking the silence, a pontoon. Bless you for breaking the silence. Grief abhors the solitude. Grief has lost its appetite. No solace, no sleep for grief. Grief abhors the solitude, the deadly silence, the stillness. No silence, no sleep for grief. It tosses and turns throughout the dark night. The, dead, the deadly silence, the stillness, grief can't swallow the bitterness. It tosses and turns throughout the dark night. It can't digest the sour sorrow, can't swallow the bitterness. Grief has lost its appetite. Grief can't digest the sour sorrow. Bless you for breaking the silence. Joan uh, thought that bless you for breaking the silence was a powerful line. And she suggested I use it for the title and for the first line. And she thought uh, a pontoon would be a good form for this poem. Um, I, I like the way it ended because I have uh, bless you for breaking the silence at the beginning and at the end and that is an important thing, was an important thing uh, through brief. But I've, I felt that maybe there's another poem in here because there were um, other ideas that I liked, like processions of if onlys and, but you don't see it in this, uh, this one poem on the left. Um, but I was happy with the, the end result. But you're right. That's one thing that happens when you do a pantoum. You lose a lot of your other lines because they're repeating. Um, you might want to get rid of dark just for the shape of the poem. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, because the shape is beautiful. That's the only place where it sticks out. And night is dark, so it tosses and turns throughout the night. Right. But yeah, Good. it's beautiful. Thank you. I, like I wondered if the pontoon would be even longer if you could go on indefinitely with the. You uh, can, yes. Yes, you yeah. can. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what I noticed was um, I like the repetition. I think that works for the poem. 
I noticed that sour sorrow was kind of hard to get around. Yeah. And you have so many other beautiful lines that you could maybe think about substituting, like there's only this black curtain or um, grief feels like drowning. They might be lines to repeat instead. Hmm. Yeah, yeah the reason I suggested Pentum was because there were so many beautiful lines that, you know, could be repeated. Grief abhors the solitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a little bit uh, put out by the fact that there were so many uh, references to <laughs> digesting, <laughs> you know, when there were other images that would perhaps be. Oh, okay. There. Swallow yeah. appetite. Okay. Yeah. And I, I like that, though, because grief, I really feel in my body and it is something I feel like I have to digest. So I don't know. I thought the personification of grief and all of those references really worked. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, the way, too, that you refer to when you have a fast, you break the fast when you're fasting for grief or religious reasons. So you have all these images of the stomach and the gut and swallowing and then to me I think of breaking the fast and you have it as breaking the silence so I think that um works really well thank you and on the top of my paper here before this next poem it says eight o'clock <laughs> so here we are at eight o'clock and again I wish we could just talk about all of these poems as long as we wanted, but we don't have that luxury. Pam. Is Pam here? I didn't unmute, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is another pan tomb that Joan suggested that might be a form that, so I really worked with form on this and it really changed a lot. Dense dough lies heavy in my hands, dusty cobwebs obscure sunlight. Exhausted, bending off needy demands, I struggle to escape my sorry plight. Dusty cobwebs obscure the light in this abode of dense despair. I must escape this sorry plight where failure and shame infuse the air. From this abode of dense despair, taking the long road which appears, failure and shame no longer ensnare. I am guided by stars, I dry my tears. Taking the long road which appears, I start a slow trek. This is rough terrain, gathering strength from the sky as it clears. Before me, the path becomes simple and plain. This is a slow trek over rough terrain. Sometimes I skirt or scale a rough rock. Before me, I see the way is plain, sure-footed now, surpassing roadblocks. Scaling boulders and any rough rock, exhausted no longer with needy demands. Faithfully, I continue life's walk. The dough is now rising and soft in my hands. So I guess this is a little bit longer pantoum than the one, the wonderful one we just heard. Um, and it came from just 12 lines. And it's about four um, versions, I think. And oh my gosh, it was so fun to do this. I've never really worked with form this hard. I thought it was really like hard work. <laughs> well, especially <laughs> since if you'll notice this, it's it's a pantoum where she changes it the second time you know so it's not an exact uh repeat of the line so yeah you had to do a lot of thinking <laughs> yeah i really appreciate your energy and um working with us <laughs> it's just awesome notice it went from untitled to a parent's lament and one of the things I was going to, you know, say um, about suggestions I gave to people is you can refocus a poem with the title. I think she did a terrific job with the rhyming. <laughs> My pontoon didn't rhyme, so this is good. <laughs> Yours didn't have to rhyme. 
No. <laughs> Other comments? Well, then let's move on. Alexander. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you are looking at my sixth and my 15th revisions. They were not all sent to poor Joan, but I have enormous appreciation for all the time she took to help me with, with what is in front of you. And uh, okay, I will read it now. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Frustration is wandering without boots through the mud of a dense maze. It's lush walls, perfectly pruned, mask branches that can wound. Its tantalizing momentum is halted by ambiguous smells of sodden vegetation, discomfort erupting in weeping and the taste of tears. Frustration is closing the mind with panic, racing up then down the pathways, slamming into the crossways wall that ends each wrongly chosen path with no way out. Now, <laughs> I have to tell you, some of her suggestions were to, I'm, I'm going to read from my paper instead of the screen. Some of her suggestions were to remove too many adjectives in the first uh, version she got, and that all of which and um, the almost reachable were very awkward phrases, so I changed them. And then um, also she gave me a beautiful line and this is what happens sometimes. It's a really beautiful line that I would have liked to use, um, weeping the taste of tears, but it was not me. And mm -hmm. so I was not comfortable using that, but I'm certainly saving it for possible use in the future. And then the interesting thing is the final version I sent her um, by the deadline was not even this after one, it was another one altogether. So this after one was after the deadline, which is why I could not, um, I, I did not send her a revision on that, but she had suggested, well, first I should say the th this, this after version that you have in front of you, um, you'll see that I left out the entire ending about the child and that was not Joan's suggestion, but it came from one of her suggestions because she said to no avail makes no sense. So I had to change that or I did change it to with no way out. Mm. Once I had no way out, it seemed highly repetitive to have that whole section on the child. So sometimes what happens when you're revising, you do what they say, they call it killing your darlings. You actually totally get rid of something that you worked for hours and hours and hours, which I did and um, just got rid of it. And I believe she thought this was a better poem and I did too. But now the fascinating thing is since this poem went to her and she gave me a suggestion about the last three lines, which is also very beautiful. Um, slamming into the crossways wall with no way out of every wrongly chosen path. Now, I like that better than my own last three lines because it's stronger and it broadens the poem kind of to life itself. But the catch is it's not quite true because in a maze, there is absolutely no way out of a wrongly chosen path. There is only one way out of a maze. Whereas in life, we can change wrongly chosen paths, can be rectified, modified, changed, even escaped from. So believe it or not, I am still working on this poem. I have eight more revisions. And as of yesterday, I had the final lines being simply Frustration is the mind, is closing the mind with panic, racing blindly through the maze, desperate to find the one way out. 
And I'm not even sure that's my last poem. <laughs> so you can see why I don't have much of an output because I do so much revising. So I'm up to 23rd revision and um, that's the end of my speech here. But, but um, it's really important to get readers and you, you need the courage, first of all, to get readers, but then they need the courage to be ruthless because otherwise you'll never learn. And, um, and then always remember that no matter how brilliant or how wonderful somebody's suggestion, you still have the last word. So anyway, that's the end of my yes, speech Yes, that's here. excellent. I'm so <laughs> glad you said that. That's excellent. Yep, you have the last word. Comments. And you don't have to apologize for 23 drafts. I don't even count my drafts. <laughs> um, I have a very low output for that reason. Yeah, I'm always working on the same poem and pulling it apart and putting it back together. Even sometimes after one is published. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 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 Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Thank Heidi. you so much, Joan, for all your efforts. You're, really, you're it's welcome. just wonderful. It's so All funny. Right. I look at the top here and I think, oh, another poem named after. And then I'm going, oh. <laughs> I'll read my poem. Uh, it's called Stepping Stone. Earth spins in vast violet with ice comets flashing from interstellar sky. Some stars glow black, holes in the Milky Way. Antique zodiac maps act only as an overlay. Earth's marble moon shines our deep space doorstep to marks of mystery, braille and diamonds to the wondering eye. To the wondering eye, braille and diamonds splashes over nighttime sky, beyond the stepping stone of our shining marble moon. Zodiacs lay our mists on alien astral worlds, black holes bend light, dark diamonds set in sable. With ice comets flashing, Earth in vast violet spins through Braille. I can tell you what we worked on some. Um, we worked on changing some words to make them more lyrical. So that was helpful to find out about what makes a word fit in that category for me, because I was new some words were prettier than others, but I didn't know all the, the details behind that. And then the other thing that uh, Joan suggested was trying a reversal form with my poem, which I slightly misunderstood. Officially, you're supposed to use the same lines, but changing the punctuation to make it work. And I thought it was more to uh, elaborate on the subjects that you touched on. So, so I have a kind of a mix of that, but I was, uh, I think I'm happy with it at this stage. And uh, it was very interesting too to, to work a, in that format. So thank you, Joan. Welcome. It was interesting because when she did misunderstand the reversal, do you understand what, how she was explaining it? In a reversal, if I can see the top of it, um, Oh, it, that is the top. Okay. Earth spins in vast violet. As you'd be coming up in a reversal, she'd be looking at those first three um, stanzas. Act only as an overlay. Antique zodiac, zodiac maps. Holes in the Milky Way. Some stars grow black from interstellar sky. With ice comets flashing, Earth spins in vast violet would be as you come up the poem. So you go down the poem and then come up the poem. And that actually works. Um, some stars glow back from black from interstellar sky with ice comets flashing. Earth spins in vast violet. Um, but what she did plays with that form and um, she stumbled on, you know, a really interesting way to go about it. It's really pretty shaped to that poem too. Comments.
I really like the reference to Braille the, mm. as, and the stars as Braille. Thank you. And I, I like the reuse of the lines, uh, even if it's not a reversal, I think just, you know, there's some really beautiful lines and mm -hmm. yeah, just resetting them somehow. It's really, really lovely. Thanks. I like the reference to the antique zodiac maps. And I, I also like the shape of it with the two center longer um, pieces in the middle. I, 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 it's just a lovely shape, how it's very symmetrical. Christy. So um, this is called the earrings. And I did follow the method that we learned in our first class because I really liked that. Um, there were, this is actually uh, act one, uh, which is missing here. There were her earrings in the bowl. Match them up, I directed. There are too many, she grumbled. But she saved them for her granddaughters. Then you sort through them, she blurted and dumped the bowl in my lap, stormed out of our mother's bedroom. Act two, there were her earrings in the bowl. Mother loved her jewelry, she sighed. Half of them are lost, I said, but she wore a pair every day. We have to start somewhere, I urged, and began sorting through the pile, left her staring out the window. Act three, there were her earrings in the bowl. There's no rush, I offered. I'm not ready for this, she sobbed, but I need to accomplish something. Let's start with her socks, we agreed and began collecting pairs, folding them tenderly side by side. So I, I can just tell you that Joan, um, I really just originally just started with the very first uh, piece and um, she suggested that I approach this. First, she suggested that I change it into more modern terminology or a more modern way of speaking, but I just loved this up approach and, and so I didn't want to change that. And then she suggested that I um, write this from my sister's perspective. And, and, th and then, then that really took off for me to, to, to step back and be able to write from where she might be coming from and how we ultimately resolved the issue, so. To put it in three acts certainly is, each one reveals a little more. Comments. Yeah, I really love the progression from earrings to pears to socks. You know, that was that was a nice transition. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Am I pronouncing Nupur? Is that how you say it? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Joy in the time of climate change. I suck the mint fresh air, flinging the windows open after a night barricaded from mosquitoes. The sun treks up the sky. I dervish dance with the leaves whirling in the wind after a still afternoon. The first mango this year glows in the sunlight. I bite its flesh, juice entering my skin. The tap spurts to life after it ran dry at 2 a.m. I drink in the music. Da 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 da. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The sky growls. Rain is here after a week long heat wave. I grab fistfuls of raindrops, washing the dust off my sphinx face. God, grow me a hump so I can store sky water for the drought inevitable. So what was the suggestion? Um, so uh, we started uh, uh, with a very different uh, version, as you can see. So the uh, initial feedback was on how uh, I could change the uh, verbs so that they don't have uh, ing uh, all at the end. And also about you know putting myself in the poem so that it is about me experiencing joy rather than just about joy. 
and then changing the verbs could also mean having more than one sentence to make the poem easier to read aloud and bring the reader more directly in the experience. And you also suggested that each sense need not have uh, one line. And uh, you talked about the vertical oval form, which is pleasing to the reader. And then I went and uh, looked that up and I also found myself uh, being drawn to it. So I tried to uh, vary the la line length. I mean, that was new to me because I always thought, you know, for symmetry and it should look like similar on the page. So I generally try to, you know, uh, make my lines uh, accordingly. And um, the example you shared on how to change the uh, verbs was also useful because you asked questions like, you know, uh, uh, where is the uh, uh, dusty day out, uh, the air that I'm inhaling outside and then, you know, the uh, water that is running dry, is it from the tap? And how am I grabbing the uh, raindrops uh, help us uh, see and feel this uh, image? And then it struck me that, you know, I could put climate change in because I was, uh, you know, in the midst of a heat wave and climate change has been really bothering me. And I've been writing a lot uh, about that. So and then you kind of like liked it. So uh, that's where we ended up. So from that simple uh, five senses exercise, I think we ended up with something, you know, which was saying uh, uh, something larger. And that was when we were corresponding, that was the most meaningful thing that came out of the email was the first one is an exercise. It was, you know, an exercise we did in class and out of it came a poem that is absolutely beautiful. Um, God, grow me a hump so I can store sky water for the drought inevitable. Um, if that's not in that that first exercise, comments. Yeah. What time is it there? <laughs> what time is it? It where is six fifty one a.m. It's ten to fifty one a.m. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here at that hour. You're just <laughs> starting your day. No, I started at uh, 4 a.m. my time because I have uh, four-year-old twins. So that's oh. the only time I get any piece to write. <laughs> I like um, some of your words, sky water for rain. I like that image and dervish dance um, stick out at me. So I like what you did there with that. Yeah. Also, that sphinx, sphinx face is another one. I, I love all the references you have to um, hydration. You have so many strong words like the tap spurts and I drink in the music and washing. So there's so many like liquid images throughout the poem that I think it, it really um, makes it stand out. Thank you. Okay, we have a little time for some of you people who I said, if we have time, we'll get to you. So if you're still out there. I know there were a few more people who said they'd be ready if we had time. No one is going to jump in here. Well, jump in if you want. Oh, here she is, Sue. I just saw her name. Are you okay, unmuting? So now I'm unmuting. So people can see it. People can see it. Can you see the poem? Yes. Okay, good. I will just read the revised then. Blocked, the words rub raw. They clash, don't match. My hands ring, press one on top the other. An earworm whispers, you are not good enough. I shiver as my damp shirt clings to my chest. The bitter taste in the back of my throat subdues the sweetest grape. I could. I confess, I have nothing. I hide my journal on the highest shelf and silently close the door. <laughs> <clears throat> so
So, so as you can see, I got rid of the most interesting phrase <laughs> on the on the draft because it didn't fit. Huh? And instead, I put in a beginning, middle, and end. So it tells a little story, whereas the first one did not have that. So those are the, and also uh, Joan said to, to get rid of the INGs, too many are, INGs are weak. And so I believe I got rid of them all. <laughs> Well, when when I go after INGs, um, it was Laurel Mills that taught me that we um, right. one you know workshop. Um, we realized everyone had ing on almost every verb, and so we um, <sighs> pantomimed throwing our ings into the middle of the room. But you you don't have to get rid of all of them. It's just when it becomes a pattern. And I think in that exercise, that exercise lends itself to right. ing when it's an exercise. Yeah, I just challenged myself not to use them. So that was good. It was good that you pointed that out. And I recognize uh, the confessional pew from our group poem. Yes, yes. That I, I might use that in another poem. <laughs> so, okay, shall I un... I Does anyone stop. else have one? Sure. No. Okay. No. One of the things that I was going to do, if we had time, we have just a few minutes, um, was to talk a little bit about the title as a means for change. Good. You know, that you can sometimes take a poem and make it an aha with a title. Um, and this is a poem by Bruce Deflison. And I'm not going to tell you what the title is. I want you to think of titles. And then I'll tell you what he titled it. A chickadee needs some 15 seconds to eat one sunflower seed. Again, a chickadee needs some 15 seconds to eat one sunflower seed. Now I'm guessing most of you are thinking about birds. Um, the title is Hillview Care Center. Hillview Care Center, a chickadee needs some 15 seconds to eat one sunflower seed. And it becomes a poem about having nothing to do but look out the window. I, you know, just a lovely refocusing. So two minutes for last comments, questions. Workshops are very, very crucial for us. And thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Also, writers groups. Yes, writers groups, workshops. Any, anytime, you, anytime you can have readers who are not it, afraid to be honest. <laughs> it, was, it was very much um, a surprise to me when I found out that the poets that I respected the most were bouncing their poems off other people and getting suggestions. I just assumed they were you know, geniuses in their own right. And maybe some of them are. Yeah, I just want to make sure we uh, thank Joan for her generous time uh, reviewing and giving feedback on poems. This has been great. A little bit atypical workshop for us, but still very, very valuable. Very. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. We were atypical. Your poems were wonderful. And I'm sure there are other ones out there that I you know, didn't get a chance to see that are equally wonderful. Thank you so much. I would ask, I tried to copy the comments that Katrina put in the chat out and it didn't seem to work. And I don't know if Tori is going to just. I will send the uh, chat stream. Transcript. Okay. 
I will send the chat stream for all the comments in the chat, so. Okay. And thank you, Tori. For yes, thank you, Tori, for getting that all set to be up on the screen. That really helped to be able to see them. No problem. You know, I have just one really quick question um, about the poem, like I did, where I took off of a format of William Carlos Williams. Now, can I submit that as a poem of my? I would subtitle poem? it after reading William Carlos Williams, um, because okay. that way an editor cannot say, well, that's like William Carlos Williams. Well, you're going, yes, it is, but you need to acknowledge that. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. We have another workshop planned for later in the year. You can find out yeah. more about it at wfop.org. And thank you again. This was wonderful. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Really Thank wonderful. you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>